okay. So first off, I'm going to have you introduce yourself and your creative career. Uh, my name is Amanda Berg Wilson, and I'm a Boulder-based theater artist um, who works both uh, in freelance opportunities, and I'm also the co-founder and the artistic director of the Catamounts, and we are a Boulder-based theater company specializing in what we call theater for the adventurous palette. I love that. That is so interesting. Thank you. Um, and how has COVID-19 affected your life and livelihood? Oh, goodness. Um, how has COVID-19 not affected my life and livelihood? Um, first and foremost, I was set um, this summer to be the assistant director um, and one of the cast members uh, in the world premiere of Theater of the Mind, which was an immersive the is an immersive theater piece that's being created uh, by Mala Gayonkar and uh, former Talking Heads frontman and Rock and Roll Hall of Famer David Byrne. So uh, Theater of the Mind was about the biggest, well, not about, it was most definitely the biggest sort of moment of my career, getting to work on this incredibly innovative piece of theater with one of the most, I think, brilliant contemporary artists on the planet. Um, and as a result of COVID, that project has been postponed until um, hopefully next summer, but uh, its postponement date has not been announced. So um, I had been working on that piece for a year almost um, in workshops, um, in uh, development meetings and design meetings. And um, in fact, the, one of the last people uh, I was in a normal work situation was, was I spent four days in a script development workshop with David Byrne um, and three other artists who were working on the project. So, um, so it was just me and, and David and four other artists or three other artists rather in the room for four days. Um, and then basically I drove home from that workshop and everything was shut down and there was no more live theater in the state of Colorado. So that was kind of the most heartbreaking and dramatic and immediate um, fallout for me as a, as a theater artist from the COVID crisis. What, how COVID has affected my career and my practice since then um, is just having to reinvent everything. So my company, The Catamounts, we uh, have a unique and original a performance event called Feed that is a food and performance event in which uh, it's a multi-course dinner in which every course is a dish, a drink, and a piece of performance. Um, and we had one of those scheduled for the weekend of April 24th. Um, and we ended up completely reinventing that event. Um, we, instead of it being all in person at a bottle shop in Westminster. We delivered, we hand delivered baskets of food and drink to our ticket holders' houses. Um, and then the whole show uh, was accessed through links to, to, to virtual content. So I had to re reinvent that. Um, I'm reinventing a whole season of theater. This was supposed to be the Catamounts or it is, it is, it still is the Catamount's 10th anniversary season, um, but we have completely pivoted all of our programming. So um, instead of doing shows at the Dairy Arts Center inside with a live audience, um, we are doing a show in August um, on a golf course in Westminster where the audience will all be in golf carts. Um, and the show takes place on the front nine holes, allowing the actors to socially distance from one another and from the audience and ensuring that the audience is in these little <laughs> self-contained, socially distant mobile units. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just rethinking an entire, an entire season of, of programming so that it can either be outside 
or conducted um, virtually? So, you know, so from just an artistic standpoint, it's just every day is, is rethinking essentially how I've worked for 25 years. Fortunately, the Catamounts are a very inventive company and we've done a lot of outdoor performance. So on some level, this is kind of a moment in which we can rise to. Um, but as a freelance artist, it's a real big bummer because half of my income is from my position as an artistic director, but half of my income annually for the last five years has been as a, as a freelancer and I have, I have no freelance work right now. So I've lost um, since COVID crisis half my income. Wow, that is shocking, mm -hmm. I bet. I'm um, super excited to hear about um, how you're sort of redirecting and not letting this whole situation bring you down. Also a huge Talking Heads fan. So that uh, is insane. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's it's, crazy. <laughs> it's, it's really crazy. And the cool thing is, is that I, I believe that that project is so innovative and exciting that it will come back yeah. when it's time. But I will tell you that if nothing else, I spent four days in a room with David Byrne and he's absolutely is brilliant and but also just sort of um, unassuming and kind and open. Wow. Um, so that was like a really wonderful, like if nothing else in my life, I got to share that four days with him and work, you know, across a table from him on a piece of theater. And it was definitely a not only a highlight of my career, but a highlight of my life. So that is yeah. incredible. I have like yeah. thinking about it. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It's pretty really amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing experience. Okay. <clears throat> That's crazy. Um, okay, so fine uh next question. Uh yes. you have obviously been awarded a COVID-19 work project stipend. Uh, would you mind just briefly telling me about your project and how it can promote connectivity in your neighborhood? Sure. So um, I guess it was about a month into the lockdown, um, a friend of mine um, posted a poem of an Irish poet who had just died. Um, and the name, I'm going to, I may be mispronouncing her name because um, it's, it's spelled very Irishly, but her name was Evan Boland. Um, and she, she died at the end of April, not of COVID, of, of, an, of another health um, issue. And it was so funny because I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person, but you know, that first month or so, maybe even the first six weeks of the lockdown, I felt so sort of in a daze, like just kind of um, like not really able to process what was happening. And I think also like there was such a, there was such an, a necessity in those early days to really kind of just, you know, I have a child and I have a company and I, I just had things that I, I couldn't take the time to grieve around what was happening because I had pardon my language, but I had shit to do. You know, I had, I had bigger issues than my own personal grief. Um, anyway, I, so I'm going to cry when I say this. So I read the poem and the poem that the friend posted was, it's called Atlant, it's called Atlantis, um, a, a lost sonnet. And the, the sort of, the gist of the poem is that when we when 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 we realize that something that is gone is gone forever um that we don't always know how to name that that we don't always know how to process that and i um and i think that you know my whole life has been dedicated to an art form um, that will emerge because it's lasted, you know, as long as humans have lasted, they've been in rituals, singing songs and telling stories. So, so it's not going away, but 
whatever it is on the other side of this, it will be different. It will not be what we left on March 13th. And I, you know, I miss being in rehearsal rooms with my fellow artists. I miss, I mean, theater can be this incredibly visceral, tactile art form that, you know, people are touching and fighting and loving and, you know, I mean, it's all part of the really, this, the, the bigness, the epicness of the storytelling that's so often involved in theater. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just read the part of it that, that really struck me. Um, uh, and cause she's, cause you know, there's the legend of Atlantis, right? That, um, that a whole city <laughs> disappears one day underneath the ocean. Um, and, and, and Bolin says, I mean, I said to myself, the world was small then. Surely a great city of must, must have been missed. I miss our old city, white pepper, white pudding, you and I meeting under fan lights and low skies to go home in it. Maybe what really happened is, and she's talking about how people could just one day lose a whole city. Maybe what really happened is this. The old fable maker searched hard for a word to convey that what is gone is gone forever and never found it. And so in the best traditions of where we come from, they gave their sorrow a name and drowned it. So there was just something about that poem that I was like, all it just unleashed something in me. I just finally felt this permission to, to mourn, to mourn, to just, to just say, it's, it's okay to feel grief around this moment. Yes, I'm healthy. Yes, my kid is healthy. Yes, I live in this beautiful part of the earth where I have the mountains outside my door and I can still get out and, and breathe fresh mountain air, even if I have to pull my mask up and down every single time I pass somebody, you know. But also, it's okay to, to give name to this sorrow or to at least try to to process it and to, and, to, and to call it out. So I started thinking about like, how could I, when this opportunity for this grant came about, I was like, what is it that I, what is it that I want to sort of share with, with my neighborhood? And I, I realized I wanted to share this poem and something connected to this poem, you know? And I started to think about what is a ritual in which we can give our sorrow a name and then drown it. Because <laughs> there's something that's so kind of fierce and warrior-like to think about like, yes, we are, gonna, we are gonna put a stake in that grief and then we're gonna, and then we're gonna drown it. And then we're gonna be be done with it. You know, we're gonna process it. We're gonna, we're gonna do something with it. And I was like, okay, how do you name sorrow and drown it? How do you name sorrow and drown it? I just kept sort of going back and forth on that. And I had heard of this thing before called seed paper. And I was like, I wonder if there's something to like being able to write the sorrows down and then do something with that paper. And then I thought if we used, if I, if I gave seed paper to people, they could write their sorrows down. You have to soak the seed paper in or, or, order to germinate it, to, to, in order to germinate the seeds in the seed paper. And then you bury it. And I just thought, well, that is a ritual. That is a ritual, you know? Um, and I worried at first because I had been told that seed paper doesn't always work. Um, so I did some research and I had a friend of mine, um, a local friend of mine say, there's actually a local company here in Boulder called Bloomin' Seeds. Um, and they make this seed paper that is really awesome. And they're a B Corp and they're a great company. So one cheap, I used a, I used a decent chunk of my my grant just to buy the seed paper but um but i will tell you it is blooming and then some so 
from this idea of giving sorrow a name from the poem, I, I created these little packages of the poem and seed paper. And um, I, I distributed it to two communities. One, my community here in South Boulder. So um, I, live, uh, I live west of Broadway um, and south of Table Mesa, um, kind of near Fairview High School. Um, and it's funny because as a theater artist and, and especially freelance one, like I've traveled all over the state doing theater. I spend a lot of time in Denver. I actually don't spend a lot of time in my neighborhood pre-COVID. So there was something about getting to know my neighborhood because I do so much walking to process kind of like just my cabin fever. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, I have this sweet neighborhood and I started to see my neighbors more and I started to learn their names. So I delivered these little packages of seed paper and the poem and, and, and a description of the ritual in which to engage to, to my neighborhood. And then I also, um, I also did it as part of uh, the virtual feed event that we had, I contributed towards that. So I now have, you know, and I haven't posted all of them yet, but a lot of photos of people having written down their sorrows on that seed paper. Um, and then also photos of the flowers that are blooming from those drowned, buried, named sorrows. That is such a beautiful project. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry I cried. I didn't know I was feeling so still raw about it. <laughs> oh my God. No, when, when you read the section of the poem, I, I started welling up. I was mm -hmm. like, wow. I mean, mm -hmm. there's something so special about a piece of poetry that is so topical that can just yank that right out of you right uh, I think that's a really beautiful way of describing it Sarah I mean I think poetry is its best like yeah it, it, it like it takes something out of us that's sort of shifting and and yeah. is nameless and then just like kind of puts a stake in it and yeah. it's and it's and it's really healing I mean it was really for me like I needed to have that moment of of grief like I needed to have it because also I think for me, what happened is um, I was then able to be like, okay, that is gone. That's not coming back. The old, right. the old life is not coming back. Mm -hmm. it, we will have more normalcy at some point, knock on wood, you know, but, but this sort of world in which many things were taken for granted is gone. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is, is that the, the, my, my first round of distribution of the poem that I did in, in conjunction with the Catamount Speed event um, was uh, right after George Floyd's death, oh, man. like right after it. Mm -hmm. And so, so many of the pictures um, of, of what people wrote down was a lot about like racism. Mm -hmm. you know and so I think it's cool that that even though I conceived of the project to be more about naming our sorrows around mm -hmm. COVID mm -hmm. that what that the what the sort of the timing of it is that it it allowed some of my audience members to process their sorrow around this current you know kind of explosion of awareness around the systemic racism in our country so totally. we always have sorrow today right like i mean that's always something that 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 we need to have rituals to process yeah certainly amazing i love this project no oh, thank you thank you i'll send you some cool pictures there's some really including yesterday i was sitting out um i was actually in a in a a town hall about a new kind of movement in the theater community around really um, going about dismantling the systemic racism that affects the theater community. And as I was sitting there, I was on my back porch because my house was hot. And then, because we, I buried some seed paper too with my sorrows. And uh, there was a little hummingbird in my zinnia, in one of my zinnias. And I just thought, God, man, there, I mean, this is, is you know I worried about this being kind of cheesy but 
there is something about now there's just this enduring reminder and I'm hopeful for my neighbors and the other folks who participated too, like a reminder that, that, that beautiful things can grow from sorrow. You know, that if we, if we, if we plant that sorrow correctly, or not correctly, that's, that's too exacting of a word, but if we, if we do something with it, rather than let it become toxic and eat away at us. Like, you know, I mean, now that hummingbird's gonna pop, you know, pollinate more flowers. I mean, it's so cheesy and, and you know, woo woo, but it's true, you know, it's true. I love that. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, metaphors are important, right? Especially right now. Like, I think we need all the metaphor and signs and, you know, that we can possibly get. I completely agree. Um, so finally, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, oh, I do want to tell this kind of fun, like little story about how I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity because I think, first of all, it got, you know, I'm a theater artist, like my medium is bodies in space. So it's a little bit hard right now because I cannot put bodies in space. I can't do it. You know, I, I can now I'm figuring out how to do it outside and distanced. But when I conceived of this project, I was like, I don't have, I don't like the very tool of my art has been, has been shut down. I can't do it. I cannot put actors in space. I cannot put audience in space. So it got me thinking differently like you know this is this was like sort of an art project sort of a ritual sort of a like I, you know it, it it really allowed me an opportunity to think about to distill kind of what I want audiences experience to be and that is to just come into the theater and to get to process something to get to to dig into themselves you know through what they're seeing and to come out on the other side um, changed, you know, that's a, that's a lofty goal. I don't know that I always achieve it, but certainly that is the goal in every single production that I stage. I want you to come out on the other side of it, having, um, unearthed something inside of you and, and processed it. So it was cool to have to think about it, you know, outside of my medium in this, in this weird sort of hybrid experimental dis distribution piece. Um, but I also, it sort of led me down a rabbit hole about this exploration of the, of the concept of Atlantis and the myth of it and how other artists have reacted to it. Um, and I ended up discovering this just really awesome 1960s song by an ar artist named Donovan, um, and it's called Atlantis. So I ended up also creating that I shared with all of the, that I also put into the little package. Um, I, I created a video with my company of us essentially like, it's a music video to the song Atlantis. Um, and it accompanies the ritual and it talks about drowning your seed paper. So that ended up just being a hoot because it it's sort of like, it's one of those songs that's like very of its time. Like there's this whole opening spoken section that's very like sort of epic and about the past kings and queens of Atlantis. And, um, but anyway, I'll share it with you because that also ended up being, th this just, this project was a great opportunity for me to really think about like, if I can't put bodies in space, how can I still communicate some of that same stuff um, to a dispersed audience? So. That was cool. That was a neat opportunity. I think you took the opportunities in the best way possible. <laughs> oh, Sarah, that's so nice. Thank you. I, I'm really intrigued by your project. I think it's very interesting. Um, I also love the Donovan song, Clara Clairvoyant. Oh, I don't know it. It's one of my all-time favorite songs. Do you know Atlantis? No, I'm looking. Oh my God, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. We'll watch the video. You'll get a kick out of it. Okay. I'm so excited. What is it called? Claire? Clara Clairvoyant. Clara. Oh, you're going to love this then. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's so great about how 
terrible situations can sometimes make us discover new things because I did, I, you know, I only knew the Donovan's, what's the one, the real famous Donovan song? I, I'm not sure. I have no idea. Anyway, I didn't know his work and I'm like, oh, he is epic and fun and whimsical and like everything yeah. I want art to be. So <laughs> I love that. Amazing. Um, I'll